All right, it's four o'clock. Welcome to the February 8th work session. If we would all please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, there's a agenda in front of us. Is there any recommendation to changes of the agenda? No recommended changes. No recommended changes. Is there a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. So moved by Mr. Cleveland, second by Ms. Morrissey. All in favor? Unanimous. Our first item up is our presentation and discussion items. Uh, high school improvement update with Ms. Heather Gordy. Hello. I guess that might help. I, up through December of 2020. Um, due to COVID changes in staffing and, and the TNL leadership um, and the new strategic plan and accreditation, much of what we're going to share with you today is going to, I'm going to be asking that we are able to wait until strategic plan has been approved and adopted so that we can make sure that any recommendations that we're making toward improving our high schools is in line with that work. Okay. So the original goal was a better representation of high school academic achievement. Now, and you know, I say that knowing that we have really strong achievement in our county, but we can always get better. So some of the items that came out of the original recommendations that were presented at, at some point last spring, it's a little fuzzy right now, um, we, we, we recommended and have instituted the six period, a student being a full-time student based on six, period, six periods of classes. Now, most of our students, however, have a full load of seven classes, but should something come up that they need to reduce a class for a wide variety of reasons, that, that is a possibility for them. Um, we began it this year and it's working well. We have not, however, shifted to a straight six period day. One of the, the idea of making a res recommendation about professional learning, this came about following one of our high school visits to um, Omaha, Nebraska with the Mid-States Consortium. And as we were there and visiting their schools, it was shared with us that professional learning is job embedded in their schools and takes place one day a week, either with an early start or an early um, dismissal in the afternoon so that teachers are still working on their professional learning during their contracted work day. We originally brought that to you last spring as an idea for high schools. It, it was put on hold, but we now re re recognize, especially coming out of TNL, that if we were to build in any type of professional learning, that we would need to be looking at a K-12 approach to that so that our middle, elementary school teachers, middle school teachers, and high school teachers alike would be able to participate in that. We also recognize that there are some, some potential problems that we would need to work out ahead of time, but that is something that we would like to look at moving forward. With the AB Block schedule recommendation, a number of years ago, when I first came to Forsyth County, we had two different types of block schedules in place. We had a four by four block that was happening at North Forsyth High School and South Forsyth High School, and then Forsyth Central High School did an AB block. So at North and South, the students were changing. They had took eight classes over the course of the year, but they took four in the fall and four in the spring. At Forsyth Central High School, we did eight courses, but they were, we were on an AB block, so our kids just went to classes every other day. And both of those worked, and that is when we built the fourth high school, the original high school improvement committee came out, and we moved to a seven-period day. So at this juncture, our high schools have appreciated the autonomy to select the type of high school schedule that they want to institute, and that is what we have in place right now. All of our high schools are doing some variation of a seven-period day. Some of them do a block. 
it just really depends. But most of them are doing something just a little bit different, building in time during the day for remediation, SEL, and topics like that. So at this juncture, we would like to continue with the recommendation that that be, that our high schools be allowed to continue to make that choice. Um, with the awarding half credits for courses at the end of the semester, this came about when we were looking at the possibility and having conversations among the committee about going back to a block schedule. And one reason that that even came up is that last year during COVID, when we made a lot of changes due to um, needing to mitigate the circumstances, our students were in oftentimes block schedule situations to reduce the amount of movement that we had. So some of our students were very comfortable with that. Some of our teachers were very comfortable with that. But when we were surveying both our teachers and our students, there wasn't a strong feeling one way or the other which way we were going to go with that. So that's why we made the recommendation to continue with local school decision with our schedule. And that's why we are suggesting that we not move forward at this time with um, giving credit at the end of the semester. And in fact, our high school principals are even thinking very differently about that because we're taking more of a mastery of standards approach. And that, that by having the full year worth of grading, it allows students to continue to master a topic. Maybe it was a topic from first semester, but they find, the light bulb finally goes off in second semester, and we want them to be able to have that opportunity with their credits. Um, <clears throat> so this year, we really have started this year with the rollout of the assessment guardrails of taking a look at the grading reporting and remediation practices for our high schools. And we rolled out with assessment guardrails of one and two, which was taking a look at success criteria and learning targets and providing formative feedback in a very intentional way across all of our schools. So TNL has supported this work in all of our high schools with, with professional learning for guardrails one and two. We never, we did not roll out all five of, five of them because we felt like a good deal of more work needed to go into them. But we are having very good conversations at the high school level with our high school principals about what consistency looks like across the county and understanding that for our high school students, it's very important that opportunity is the same regardless of where you go to high school. And another one that had come up, another recommendation that had come up, dealt with Val and Sal and expanding our honors for our, for our graduating seniors. And this year, all of our high schools will be recognizing and distinguishing honor graduates from high honor graduates within their graduation ceremonies and in their programs. Historically, our, an honor graduate was anyone that had a 3.5 or above as their final GPA for high school. And with the type of classes that our students take in Forsyth County, we have many students that have well over a 4.0 as a GPA, and we felt it appropriate to provide different types of honors depending upon where your GPA falls. So if you are a high honor graduate, you would have a different color tassel than the honors graduates who have a different color tassel than our regular graduates at graduation. And we, we intend at this juncture to keep Val and Sal as recognitions for our high school students. And then the last recommendation that came to, the last two recommendations that came to um, the board last spring were addressing quality points and the removal of class rank from Forsyth County Schools transcripts. At this juncture, we are requesting and making the recommendation that we revisit the setting of quality points until after the strategic plan has been adopted by the board. But, and we feel like by taking a look at what the strategic plan is calling for in terms of goals and taking a look at our accreditation recommendations, that we want to make sure that we are in line with those items as we're making any decisions about high school and moving forward with any type of change with the high schools. And then finally, with the removal of class rank from our Forsyth County Schools transcripts, we're also asking that we can continue to 
do what we're doing as having them posted on transcripts and waiting again for the approval of the new strategic plan. We feel that at this juncture, we can't make the best decisions moving forward until we have that information. Does anybody have any questions about any of these? Okay, all right. I love the um, honors and the high honors mm -hmm. split. I think that's wonderful because I think um, I think that's important. You know, not only to separate but just to keep that honors level there. Mm -hmm. um, and I like the look at the professional learning. I guess I think I missed it the first time or back whenever you first presented because it might have been April. I can't remember exactly when that, that we came. It, but I like it was. I like that it is. You know, not only the student experience teacher experience, so mm -hmm. I like that. Um, so, and I know a lot of this is going to be put off while you're gathering more information mm -hmm. and waiting to see what's going on with the strategic, strategic plan. Um, but when you go back to the, the credit, I guess, the half mm -hmm. point credit, mm -hmm. and then you're going to focus more on mastery of skills, um, do you have an idea of another recovery model besides that point, or are you still just kind of in the ex like well, exploration? Let me make, I, I didn't really explain this, but right now our students are awarded credit at the end of the school year for any class that they take. So what that was making the suggestion for is that halfway through the class, they would earn credit and it would go to the transcript halfway through the year. Okay. And we did that when we were on a straight block schedule. When we moved to the seven period day in year long grading, the decision was made to move the posting of the credit to the end of the school year. Okay. Okay. This is the class lasts all year. Yes. Right, instead of a half of the And I guess that so might be helpful if somebody moves. That's the trend. Yeah. yeah, so right now, if we have students who move away from Forsyth County, we post half credits to their transcript. If we have a student that, for whatever reason, needs to go from one course to the next, we also post a half credit for that course to recognize the work that they put in um, over the course of that semester. And then we also have a lot of half credit courses that naturally go on to the transcript, like health, personal fitness, and our um, AP Calculus AB course, which they take a whole course in the fall and a whole course in the spring. But the majority of our courses are year long. And then I have another clarifying mm -hmm. question. Yes. Um, uh, I think it was the A, B, um, Okay, A, P, dual enrollment, and I, B. Yes, yes. yes. Um, so is there a, oh, no, that's not my, that is another question. Though. Okay. Is there a max set currently on the I, B and the, no. So there's no max set so up. So right now, we have students who will take six or seven AP courses throughout their school day, and then they will often sign up through GAVs to take a number more, sometimes one, sometimes two. We've seen students even choose to take three or more AP classes through Georgia Virtual. In addition to the six or seven that they're taking during their regular school day in Forsyth County Schools. Okay, so then they're getting those Quality points, Quality points added, added. for the extra that they're doing outside yes. of school. Okay, so you're just kind of looking at a way to, okay. Yes. Um, and then courses versus credits, I probably mm -hmm. should already know this. Okay. But, so you're on a seven-day course at some of the high schools? Seven-day, well, an eight, seven-period day. Seven-period day. But some of, our, some of our high schools are doing the... Monday, Tuesday, Friday, seven period day. Okay. Wednesday and Thursday are block days where they take three of their classes on one of those days and four of the classes on the other day. Okay. And that fourth class, like on Wednesday, you'd go to second, fourth, and sixth period. You might also, you would go to instructional focus or Raider, Raider time or Bronco time or at Lambert lunch and learn. Everybody has a different name for it. It's that time built in for remediation or acceleration, whatever okay. students need. And you're saying right now that's defined at the local school level? It is. Our, our high schools have chosen the schedule that they want and have appreciated the autonomy <laughs> to be able to do things a little bit differently than their neighbor. Okay. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, 
I have one more question. The um, the transcript. Yes. How it is now, it all goes out of the transcript. Yes. And I know that from the community, at least at the, or I have received mm -hmm. information from the community that um, they did not want it fully removed. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you've received that information at all or, or what, but I, I guess maybe as we move forward, because then I spoke with someone um, from, from Forsyth County and they said um, if it's removed, someone can still go into the counselor and like request their own copy that they could then send up. Is, is they can true? still find out. So right now at any given time, a student can pull up IC, parent portal, student portal, and see their transcript and where, what their class rank is. And that, that gets computed at the end of each grading period. So, well, not the grading period, but at the end of the semester or the end of the school year. So they can go and see what effect did that AP Calculus AB course have on my overall GPA. Okay. So I believe that some students find it more stressful to see what that ranking is than others. So what we have is a split, really, with some people that think we should remove it for a variety of reasons, and then others who say, we need to be able to see what our, our class rank is at any given time. Okay. But this is a question not about, this is just about when you send the transcript, right? Not they can still get access to it. Their, their counselor could still be able to tell the schools, like through Common App, for example, when they're applying. Mm -hmm. There's a counselor portion of Common App that a counselor goes in after a student does their portion and provides information. And there are are a number of different ways that colleges are requesting this information. But when a student goes in to fill out their application for UGA or Georgia Tech, they also get asked, what is your class rank? So stu some students are saying they'd be OK with someone else answering that question. Other students and parents are saying, we want to be able to see it. OK. Thank you. But it's an either or right now, right? It's either or. Because of like, I see, we can't. We would have to turn it off for the whole school, right. or the whole high, all of our high schools. You couldn't turn it out. You couldn't ask kids what they prefer and then do it student by student. So I think right now it's an all. It's yeah. We have it turned on right now. And I will say that after you presented this in April, we did receive a lot of feedback from yes. the community, a lot, and mm -hmm. none of them said they wanted to remove the the class ranking mm -hmm. which, that's the feedback we've got from which the which is really interesting because okay, well. this this came to us from students it was not generated by staff it was yeah. students part of our advisory committee saying this is creating a really unhealthy situation in our schools people are looking that at that all the time it causes this ultra competitive and then mm -hmm. kids are taking those additional courses to try to bump that up yes and our students were saying you know, we think it would be healthier if it, if it was removed, but you're right. Once we put that out last spring, we heard from the adults in our community that, no, we shouldn't be doing that. So that's why we put it kind of on the back burner for now. Yeah. But masking it isn't going to change that drive. Their kids are going to still take exactly. it. I mean, just not having it there, they'll still take the classes. So it's kind of an artificial, I, I get they're trying to take away the stress, but well, and I think it's, that's not going to change. Them. Yeah, I mean, it's nice that we're looking at it, but I mm -hmm. think looking at the other ways to kind of like you're saying, the number, it is what it is based on the system that we have for them to mm -hmm. get that number within. So maybe if the system has changed, then the number won't be so. What, but, but I guess my thing is regardless if it's turned off, mm -hmm. or, or if it is turned off, still the ability for someone to be able to submit their class rank, to have it be a valid To get a number, scholarship, yeah. You it's, know, yeah, yeah it's so. got to be. Still, it will still be available. It's still available. There's, there's still a rank. It's just whether it's there for them to see every time they log in. I would. I wanted to bring a seed forward, not for this one, because mm -hmm. this one's kind of been vetted and done, and you're waiting on the strategic plan to be. But you know, we've gone through COVID. We've now reassessed our virtual capabilities, and we're looking at that and growing those right and get better yes. at actually teaching that method. What you know, we've always talked about year round school. Now, a lot of people like it, some people don't like it. But the virtual option gives you that ability to do that to maybe not just for credit recovery, but for credit banking, if you want to call it. Like you said, AP students, you're really, your high motivated students will do that. 
they'll go and take something extra to bolster their rank and their GPA because that's an important thing. But it could also be they just need a little bit of flexibility during the year to, to not have to feel pressure because they want to take an AP course this year. So get some of the other out of the way so they can do that. So look at possibly taking a single virtual course over the summer uh -huh. and, and banking that credit so that now I'm not stressed to get that extra credit in there and I can afford the time with AP. Yes. So just a, a seed toward the future as we get with the we virtual. Have hundreds of kids that take fitness right now in the summer. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they do that to clear their schedule to take something else. I can see it being useful for intro courses, especially if you're an eighth grader or ninth grader, if you could figure out, oh, I might be, and it's only one course, but it might give you a feeling of whether that's a route you want to go or you want to go this mm -hmm. way. Because once you get in that pathway, right, once you get to your junior year, it's really it's too late. So. It keeps their brain active over the summer, too, you know, if that's something they need and they need a little bit of focus on that. It keeps their motivation to learn. Because we're supposed to be lifetime learners anyway, so we right. do it as adults and we learn all the time. Um, and just giving them that opportunity maybe and make it more formal really get it out there for them, know they can do this, and it's not just when I'm failing, I've got to get caught up, now I'm sensing more pressure. It's a, a good thing to do. It's common. I know so. this is more of a Drew question, but Heather, Leanne, off the top of your head, do you know about uh, what other courses students are taking in the summer other than the fitness one? Health, personal fitness. There's a math course. Spanish. Doing Spanish Wrap one. Spanish requirements. I think they're doing an intro to healthcare this summer. I think. And you're right, Dr. Davis, that helps free up, um, especially if they want to do pathways or mm -hmm. some additional academic electives. And if they take their personal fitness, mm -hmm. their health, some of those classes over the summer, then they do, they are free to take some of those academic electives. So would right. that be a conversation that that a student would have, like if some, if, would a student have that with their counselor to approach that and be like, hey, I'm interested in, I guess how would they go out and find those courses? Well, those gifts. especially if you're in middle school. Um, FVA has shared their summer offerings okay. with our counselors at both middle and high school to share with students. Yeah, and it might just be some marketing around that from, from Drew or something as he rolls those out saying, hey, here's some options, guys, mm -hmm. and gives them an incentive to do it. It's not an ideal time to do an AP. Because if you took an AP in the summer, then you're not taking the final exam until spring. And that really would put you... It's more about clearing the plate yeah. for that AP so they can do the good memory. things during the year. It's clearing but the just plate a, a Just a seed to plant because as our, we grow our virtual. We have a lot of students who want to do a career tech pathway. They want to take AP classes. They're in the band. And it, it's hard to get all of that in. So, yes. I have uh, just one question. Okay. Just to clarify, the guardrails for assessment practice one and two. Yes. Do either one of them require the grading schedule to change from A to F to a one to a five rating? No. Okay. Not at the high school level, no. Really, for, for, for the guardrails for assessment, we were looking at using success criteria to evaluate student learning and to look at how teachers are using formative feedback to inform their practice as well as to make sure that students are aware of where they are formatively along the way before they take a summative. Thank you. All right, any other questions? All right, thank okay. you so much thank for your you. time. That was an awesome presentation. Very informative. Uh, the next up is the accreditation update with Ms. Lee Ann Rice. Good afternoon. Well, I am pleased to present to you the full results from our accreditation engagement review. This occurred on January 23rd to 26th. Accreditation occurs every five years. And so this is a, um, an extensive review of our school system and um, a summary of those results. Just as a summary, each of your board governance goals, I believe is covered through this presentation. And I wanted to start just with a summary of what accreditation is. I, I think sometimes we have um, some misconceptions about this and why we look for accreditation. This is a process where um, schools and school districts are certified as having met minimum quality standards. 
they're really looking at continuous improvement and making sure that we have a culture where conditions, practices, and processes are focused on effective teaching and learning. That's why we're all here. We want our students to learn and grow every day. So we want to make sure that everything we do in our school system is organized around those goals. This review happens every five years. A third party is going to look at our documentation. They're going to interview stakeholders, and they'll provide us with feedback on what we're doing really well and maybe some recommendations for where we can do a little better. Um, one of the reasons we need to focus on accreditation, if a student attends an unaccredited school, they're going to have difficulty transferring their credits, applying to college, or receiving financial aid. Here in Georgia, to receive the HOPE scholarship, you must be a graduate from an accredited school. So this is important for our families as they're looking at their next steps. When we have students who transfer to Forsyth County, if they don't come from an accredited school, we don't accept their credit. So they have to either get that credit through passing an EOC course or another test for that course or taking a subsequent course and then we give previous credit for that. So the accreditation process is very important to certify that our students are getting a high quality education. As I said, our review took place January 23rd to 26th. It was a virtual review due to COVID. There were nine team members who came in and collectively had 237 years of experience in education. So a very well um, experienced team understanding different aspects of education. They interviewed 353 stakeholders. They looked at everything from you all as the governance team, also spoke with district leaders, school leaders, certified staff, including teachers, media specialists, instructors, technology specialist, counselors, classified staff, including representatives from our technology department, uh, food and nutrition, custodial staff, parents, students, and community members. There are three major domain, domains, so they focus on leadership, learning, and resources, and there's 31 total standards from which we're evaluated. On the next few slides, I'm going to show you our actual results and the ratings that we received. But before, I wanted to let you see the color coding system um, and the levels of, of um, standard attainment that we're striving for. So each of those 31 standards is going to be rated and color coded. Blue is saying that we have exceeded standards. We are an exemplary district. Our work is impacting the work of our students and our school system. And these are noteworthy practices that we have. A green or an improving rating is meeting standards. That's saying that is where we should be. That's a, um, we've met the standard. We've demonstrated proficiency at that level. If you see a, a yellow standard, that means we are working on that standard. We are demonstrating some proficiency, but we want to keep improving in that area. And a red standard means we haven't met the standard at all, or there's no evidence to show that. So you can see we're striving for all green and blue. That's what we would like to see. Now, within each of those 31 standards, they're looking at five different elements of that standard. So they're looking at engagement. Are we including many different stakeholders in our decision making? They're looking at the implementation and how well we're implementing those different processes. They're looking at results. Are we using data to make our decisions? How are we taking those results and helping us grow and improve? They look at sustainability. So are these practices in place in a long-term manner? And what they use is at least three years. They want to see that implemented for three years or more. Within the aspect of this, because we had COVID, there was a little flexibility. There were some things we started maybe five years ago. We might have had to pause, but they did take that into consideration and didn't count it against us. And then embeddedness is looking at, is this a part of our culture? that if the leadership here left, would those practices still continue? That's just a deep ingrained piece of the culture that we have in Forsyth County. So on the next few slides, you're going to see each of those standards within the domains. I'm going to focus on one domain at a time and the standards within that domain. And you'll see ratings from a one to a four on engagement, implementation, results, sustainability, and embeddedness. And then you'll see the overall color coding where we are. So like I said, we want to see green and blue. So the first domain I'm going to show you is leadership. And you see all blue. This is phenomenal. This is saying of those 11 standards connected to leadership, we are exceeding the standards of expectation for the work in our system involving leadership. When you look down, this is these are things looking at um, 
Do the actions of the system focus on our students and their outcomes for learning? Do we follow a continuous improvement process? Does the governing authority follow the policies that are established? Lots of different things on here. You're going to see all threes and fours on those individual elements of each standard. On the next slide, I'd like to point out some specific things that the review team specifically noted about us. They gave us a commendation for leadership and specifically said that the dedicated and highly qualified governing board, superintendent, and system leaders provide focused <coughs> leadership with a clear direction and commitment to the school system's continuous improvement. This all stems from our leadership, including you all, including our district leaders and our principals that are setting a great standard for the decisions that we're making. There were several pieces. I just took their exact words and put a few things on here um, that they used as evidence for why they ranked us so highly in each of these areas. So again, looking at our governance team that is committed to following policies and adhering to those policies for our effective practices, the fact that you all were recognized at the 2019 Governance Team of the Year here in Georgia, which is quite an accomplishment. The interviews that they conducted talked about leaders always finding ways to serve our children in the best way possible. They specifically noted some of the programs that we have to develop leaders in our program, which I know we can thank Mr. Joey Perkle, who's recently retired, and now our Deputy Superintendent Mitch Young, who's continuing this work, but programs like our aspiring leaders, aspiring principals, and especially our Class A program. We don't just focus on developing leaders in our certified staff, but also our classified staff as well, and that was highly recognized. They said we have a laser focus on continuous improvement and again commending us for the strong leadership and our ongoing commitment to our planning and pr protecting the operations of our school system. The next area is learning. Any better or getting worse? There's no status quo, absolutely. Again, within our learning capacity, Almost all of our standards, 11 out of the 12, were exceeding standard. One is meeting standard, and that comes back to assessment and grading and how we're using data and, and the consistency across our district. You just heard Heather talk about, as part of the High School Improvement Committee, we're talking about grading practices. We're talking about assessment and making sure that consistency is there. That is a defined area of need for us, and that's something that our department, as well as the other departments at the district level, are working with our school leaders on. Specifically in the learning domain, they gave us a commendation that said a supportive learning culture based on strong positive relationships exists in this school system. And I think those are things we're all very proud of. You'll notice it doesn't say that we achieve the highest data, the highest achievement level. We have the highest scores. That's not what we're about. We're about relationships and we're about building a culture for learning and growing. And I think that was recognized here. Um, when they conducted their interviews. They talked about some of the words that were used to describe our school system, especially being a large system with a small system feel, that we're a family, that we're supportive and dedicated, encouraging, that we follow teamwork and we're accepting. They also talked about how deeply ingrained the learner profile is in our level of work, that every team, every interview team they um, met with specifically referenced the learner profile from community members, parents, and staff. They talked about our CTAE programs and how our district doesn't just focus on preparing students for college, but look at career readiness, job readiness, whatever goals that students have when they leave our high schools, and that we do a really good job providing AP courses, CTAE courses and pathways. We provide dual enrollment options, internships, and work-based learning opportunities for our children. They talked about how aligned our community and our schools are. That's a big part of Forsyth County success. We couldn't do the great work that we do without our community support. The parents, the business partners that, that we align with to provide these opportunities for our students. They talked again about all the programs and practices that help us build these strong positive relationships and encouraging us to continue to use data to make our decisions and building those, those positive relationships. Again, commended us for our concentrated efforts at assessing and communicating that progress, but encouraged us to continue this work so that we're protecting those practices and having consistency across all of our classrooms and schools. 
And then finally, our resources domain. Again, you're seeing almost all blue, almost all exceeding standard in the work that we're doing. The one area that they rated us at meeting standards was attracting and retaining qualified personnel who's supporting our system's purpose and direction. The data that they used for this was looking at our changing student demographics that we've moved to a minority majority student population and encouraging us to look at our staff population as well so that that's a little more reflective of, of our students. And again, a commendation that we received says that our school system demonstrates strategic resource management that includes long range planning and wise use of resources to support our mission and vision. They specifically noticed our highest, that we have the highest financial efficiency rating, that we also have the highest possible bond rating. We're one of very few school districts in our state and across the country that have achieved financial ratings such as this. They looked at our fund balance, they looked at our budget, they looked at the fact that we've had the same millage rate for the last seven years and are continuing to operate a highly successful school system on, on this millage rate and this budget. They looked at our digital resources, how we um, have integrated these into teaching, learning, and operations um, for not only our organizational effectiveness, but our professional practice and our student achievement levels. They've commended us on our commitment to access and the way that we use these resources and materials in all areas and um, continue to encourage us to use data to make these decisions. The team applauds us for our formalized processes to identify personnel needs and to attract, recruit, and retain highly qualified staff, but also encouraged us to focus on recruitment to look at a more diverse applicant pool. And as a former principal, I can say, other than making sure that all of the people I served, the students and staff in my building were safe, the next most important thing I did was hire the highest quality staff member to serve those students. And so just enhancing our applicant pool gives us that opportunity to find that very best person, whoever can support our children. And finally, after they rated us, they give us an overall score. That score is a holistic measure of our overall performance. It's a score that ranks between 100 and 400. And it takes the ratings from all three of those domains that you've just seen. Their goal is for a school system to have what they call an IEQ or an index of education quality at at least a 275. They feel like that score at 275 is saying that you're beginning to reach that impact level or that blue level that you've been meeting most of your standards and you're striving toward exceeding some of those standards. Our score was a 381.13. The average score of all of the schools in this accreditation over a five-year period ranged between 278 and 283. So I wanna stress to you that for Scythe County, score was 100 points higher than what an average score is. And our lead reviewer said she thinks this might be the highest score. She hasn't seen a score this high. She was very complimentary of our district. She even joked about moving here or recruiting some of our staff, which we won't let happen, um, but was just so complimentary of the embeddedness, the ingrainedness of everything that we do here, that we focus on students, we focus on their needs, and we back that up with the decisions that we make from our resources to our people to the decisions that you all make from the, from the board level all the way down, everyone in this system. It's quite an accomplishment and something that I am very proud uh, to be a part of. Well, you should be because uh, the way that you led this and organized the whole process with you and your team, uh, it was amazing just to be part of. And Thank so you. You should be very proud. It was a lot of work. Well. Totally worth it. And I think what I'm most proud of, Mr. McCall, is the fact that we were very transparent. We rated ourselves pretty hard and in some standards lower than what they rated us. We're high, we have high expectations here in Forsyth and our children deserve our very best. And they, you know, our families expect that from us. Um, and so it was an honor to, to organize this work, but it was our real work. And I think that's what makes me the most proud is they saw us for who we are and for what we do. Um, and then just moving forward, looking at this data, you know, as Dr. Bearden says, we are either getting better or we're getting worse. These are phenomenal ratings, but we're not done. And we see areas that we can do better, and we will. And so our next steps, we want to continue our work with those consisting principles around assessment. How do we, how do we help students see 
what they need to learn and where they are in the learning process. And that's a big part of, as Heather mentioned, setting those learning targets, identifying that success criteria so students know if they're meeting the target, and then giving them feedback along the way on what they're doing well and what they need to get better on. So by the time they do take a summative assessment or we assign that grade at the end of the year, they've had every opportunity to master that standard. That's the goal we're working for, and we'll continue to work on that leading the way through the teaching and learning department. We also want to make sure that we continue to use data. This is something Dr. Bearden preaches to us at all times. We make decisions based on data. And so specifically, we'll be looking at that with our professional learning, our technology, our instructional resources, and making sure not only are we using data to choose those resources, but we're also measuring the effectiveness and making sure that we're being good stewards of those financial and human resources with which we're trusted. And then all of this also connects so deeply with our strategic planning. We'll take the results from the accreditation review and use that as part of our strategic planning process so that we make sure those um, goals and objectives and action steps we create for our strategic plan continues to help us grow and improve as a district. What questions can I answer for you? Quite a few. It is one, I do know that it is an international um, accreditation, and so there are districts and individual schools all across the world that follow this. I could dig a little deeper and give you specific. Oh, it's not like 100 schools. It's, yes. And those are all schools and districts that have been evaluated over the last five years. So for. He's about to go through theirs coming up. Yes, later this month, they will go through theirs. In the state of Georgia, there's two accrediting agencies. So you have Cognia, and then I believe it's the Georgia Accreditation Commission. Um, most of the larger school systems utilize Cognia. The Georgia Accreditation Commission is not international. No, 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 it's strictly just for Georgia. Yes. Yes, so we're being compared amongst uh, school systems all across the world. Well, that makes sense with, you know, our, our population of students, That's I would correct. say, as well. Mm -hmm. you know, that to maintain international and if we have two options and one doesn't have international presence then the other one is well, we very much have a global student body mm -hmm. that we fully expect well once they graduate from our schools and move on to wherever we'll work through around the world mm -hmm. and so you're right it is important that we use standards that are internationally based not just based in our state well and we're we score number one in state on almost everything so we're looking to compete even higher. So we need to go beyond Georgia to make sure that we're competing even higher to raise our standards. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think it's interesting that they, uh, they put a lot of thought into the strategic planning too, that they're referencing, hey, let's let you guys go through your strategic planning and be part of that and to, to focus on that. I think that was really good for them. Uh, are you going to, are we gonna be able to post this on the website so this is very transparent to the community of these are the standards we met, this, these are the three next steps we have? We, so would you like this PowerPoint? Yes. Attack? Absolutely, okay. yes, yeah. which is why I took the screenshots so that we had everything public and transparent. It's, I'm you. very proud of the work. Yeah, should be. Very yeah. Good. Thank you. I, um, w along with the accolades, um, you know, I always tell people that I feel like I'm riding everyone's coattails, right? Like, because everyone who's in leadership or even working, you know, at various levels have just been here so long and really have built this just great system. Um, so I'm, I love being a part of it. I love what you all have done. Um, and I guess I also, too, want to just stress, because I, I know there's been, um, some interpretation that, you know, this accreditation is this major, um, you know, whatever comes out of it is what we're going to follow, and this is kind of our path. Um, but, but, you know, like you put here, it's just part, and it's, it's just one part of many that right. we use for a success trajectory. So it's not, you know, this is not the roadmap that we use, but it's one part of the tool that we're going to use. Absolutely. To and the, you know, the commendations and the recommendations that come from that, that's all they are. They're recommendations. They're not requirements. They're not mandates that we have to follow. We have met accreditation. We are an accredited school system. Um, and so this is feedback for us from an outside group that what they're seeing, and then we can take and do what we want with those recommendations. To Darla's question, my good friend, Dr. Bennett, texted me <laughs> some information about Cognia. Thank you. Um, 
Cognia accredits 30, you 30, That's right. 36,000 primary and secondary public and private schools in 85 countries with nearly 30,000 of those in the United States. So think about that for a second. There are 159 school systems in Georgia. They accredit 30,000 wow. school systems in the United States. So you're comparing ourselves to 30,000 30, school systems in our country and there's 85 countries, countries that are accredited through Cognia. <laughs> we have a lot to celebrate. And also the review team is not necessarily employed by Cognia. They're, they're no. people like us. Yes. They're, they're leaders from around the country that have come together to perform this audit, if you would. Absolutely. They are, um, our lead evaluator was a retired superintendent, but there were also um, people on the team, uh, a director of professional learning from a district here in Georgia, many from districts uh, across the country uh, in various roles. And they try to have a mixture of roles so that you're getting different lenses into the work that we do. Several of our team members have served on accreditation teams in other districts uh, across our country so that we can see that process as yeah, well. So the it's a great point. community kind of knows who that team is. And yes. that's 20 to 30 years experience per team member. And I did recruit them. <laughs> While we were on the on our call, I let them know we did have openings on our website if they wanted to Excellent. check that out. <laughs> so again, just to reiterate, and Leanne did a great job of covering this. So 29 out of 31 are blue, but the two that are green, we're already working on. We have been working on the mm -hmm. grading piece. We've been working on for some time now. Mm -hmm. That is a very challenging conversation. There's lots of opinion around grading and reporting, as you guys well know. And the other one, for several years now, Cindy and her team have been very active in going out and recruiting minority candidates to consider um, applying for jobs in Forsyth County. Once again, to Leanne's point, you know, we're, we're not an affirmative action organization. We're always going to hire the best candidate, but it's only reasonable to, to assume that if you increase your minority candidate pool, you're going to hire more minority candidates. And we're seeing that. We're starting to see some results of that. Uh, and Dr. Jamie Brown, who works in Cindy's office, is our primary recruiter, goes to a lot of job fairs, um, uh, representing Forsyth County Schools, and we're starting to see some results. So I really do believe five years from now, when we go through another accreditation, we're going to be able to show that we've demonstrated growth in those two areas. Just one other thing, Leanne. Um, I know sitting through the learning section, the, when you guys were doing all the assessment and you were grading, you were coming up with your numbers, it was hours and hours of meetings. Mm -hmm. And like you said, staff were hard on themselves. But don't you think going through that process, there was, you know, we were up in 380, all the people in the room talking, collaborating, and don't you think that in and of itself was going to help us improve because the sharing and the conversations they were having, lifting each other up and talking about their processes, like to me that was already improvement along the way. Absolutely. I think that's a great example of where the process is more important than the product. And Absolutely. and that conversation and that collaboration, it, it really was very critical to, to our growth as a system. And my final comment, we shared the results of this with our leadership team. Um, it, the mood was very celebratory. I mean, we've gone through two really challenging years with, with COVID and everything. And, and on top of that, to, to go through an accreditation, uh, and starting the strategic planning process, you know, it's just been a lot on, on the plate. But to have an outside organization come in and give us really what I would call a, a stellar review uh, was very uh, affirming for the work we've been doing over, over the years. And again, and Leanne pointed out this, but I want to say it again. It really does take, for us who are the staff in Forsyth County Schools, to have a board of education that is appropriately involved, but it gives us the resources and support and an autonomy we need to be able to do the work on a day-to-day -day basis while being very clear about your expectations is so critically important. And it's, again, so affirming when an outside agency comes in and clearly sees that there's direction from the board, yet under that direction, there's lots of resources and support to make it happen. And that's, that's a winning formula, and I just applaud you guys. You should be as proud of this as the staff is proud of this. And I hope our community is equally as proud, because they should be. You know, anybody who lives in our community, any parent who has children attend uh, our school system should be very proud of, of the quality product that, that they're given in our school system. So thank you for, for your work in this. 
and Leanne, great thank job. You. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Appreciate great it. job. Yep. You're not going anywhere. So no, you. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Just pulling up the next one. Nice. So you're part of this team? Tag team. <laughs> Elbow partners on this one. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so just as Dr. Bearden alluded to the challenges with grading and reporting on both sides, so too are there challenges with books, as you're, um, as you're ever aware as well. Mm -hmm. So before we get started, I, I just want to preface this by saying, um, with every challenge comes an opportunity. Um, when there were... Um, when there were the initial concerns with books that were brought forth several months ago, um, we went back as a district committee, media committee, and made some revisions uh, for improvements, shortened the, the length of time um, for the book challenge process. And uh, more recently as well, we went back to the table um, to find out, if, are there more improvements and enhancements that we can make? Um, also being sensitive to both sides um, of the topic as well. So really what Leanne and I are going to be sharing are some of the updates that we've, uh, that came from the last meeting that we just had um, this past week. And again, um, it might not be perfect. It's always going to be a work in progress. But with every opportunity comes a new chance to make improvements on it. So where we are today might not be where we are next week or next month or next year even. So um, with that, Let's go ahead and get started. So when we started off and we met with the district media committee, one of the questions that we asked was what can be, um, what can be done to support parental involvement in student book selections? We recognize that parents should be involved in uh, the book selection process with their children. They should have the conversations with uh, the type of books that meet their family values. Um, but that being said, we wanted to find out other ways that we can you know, help involve the families on that. So one of the things we spoke with with Follett. Follett is the company that that owns Destiny, which is our library management software system. And we recognize when we spoke with them that they have already identified that there are concerns nationwide. The conversations that are taking place in Forsyth County, they're taking place all over the country. Um, so we shared with them the concerns that were brought forward by the board members and the families as well that um, that there needs to be some type of uh, necessarily accountability, but involvement um, that would help uh, involve the parents in that process. So one of the things that they shared with us, and this is something that they had just shared recently, um, is that they're working on a process for parents to get an email notification whenever a child checks out a book. Um, that notification may include the title, the description, it might include tags or even a description. It dep depends on what's in Destiny and what we have available to them. Um, and that's a future enhancement that they have down the road, but they identify that there's a way that, and that would be an, an immediate enhancement. So if a child checked out a book at 8 30 in the morning, um, then they would get an immediate notification. So they also just let us know recently that um, at a school district in Wisconsin, they worked out a way that they can set a time um, uh, duration so that at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, all the emails could, be, could go out so that if a parent um, opted in to get a notification for their child when their child ch checked out a book that day, that we can set a time so that they will get an e email notification. Then they can look at it if they choose to review the book or do some searches, have some concerns with it. Uh, they can do that and they can have a conversation with their child about the book. Uh, that's something that we're actually working on actively right now. Uh, Jason L is working with Kathy Carpenter and her team so that uh, we can look at how we can uh, bring over a new data file uh, into Destiny. Um, and uh, Fall has already told us that once we get that configuration set up, uh, it won't take very long for them to do some configuration. So that's one positive that we feel as though that will involve parents right away. And uh, we, we're hoping that we can get that set up in the next week or so. And I'm sure we have parents out there that we can get that would love to pilot this and test this for us. Because the goal is to have parents um, opt in, notify the schools. We haven't worked out the details. Um, but that they would uh, then notify the schools that they would like to receive those email notifications. Another conversation we had with Follett is actually the ability to restrict student access based on parent requests. So this is a, a, a long conversation that took place last time, and that's so that um, depending on the, the tags that are in Destiny, um, depending on the level of books that are in Destiny, parents uh, would actually be able to opt in to um, make specific choices for what their child can check out. Um, that's something that's on the roadmap for Destiny. They said that it's been brought up um, uh, frequently across the country. Um, they haven't given us a timeline. We hope that it will be sooner rather than later. 
Um, but with that also comes some challenges because within our school systems, within our libraries, we don't have a person checking out books for every single child. They're interactive. They're, they're instructional uh, areas as well. So the media specialist might be teaching a lesson over in the corner, and we have the checkout computer set up in a kiosk mode. So the kids will go in, they'll either scan their card or they'll type their code in it and, and scan it. So are some, there are some things that, that create barriers with that that we'll have to overcome and we'll have to look into other sides of that. Um, but those are just some things that we'll have to look at down the road because it's not, um, not all schools have someone that's there um, that if, it, if a block comes up, if a parent puts a restriction on a book, that uh, the media specialist would be able to run over and, um, and clear that out or, or have a conversation with the child. So there are some details that will come with that that would have to flush out too. Yes? Is it, is it safe to assume like any enhancement that Destiny would make, like let's say this, um, what was it? The, no, the restrict yes. student access. Because I realize, you know, I've had and I've heard many conversations about that, right? Some right. people um, would like it, but then it could take away the time of the media. Or how would you really control that or regulate right. that? And plus, I think it's great for kids to learn the skills which you know autonomy right like I'm independent I'm checking out my book I'm picking my book so I think that's where the conversation can come right. with the parents that you can check out whatever book you want but please don't read it till we get home mm -hmm. you know and we'll do it together right. that's just a, a family rule um, so um, but and I've been reading different articles and you know I've read s some places where there's st certain student populations that would like, you know, books to be identified clearly, like, you know, a certain color or something so they know, okay, I can find it quickly. Um, and then there's others who don't want it because they don't want to be singled out because, so whatever's created through, I guess, Destiny, is it going to be legally compliant? Do we have to run that through our lawyers? Or how, how does that work? Is, is Destiny a private company? Follett is a private company, and they own they own Destiny, which is a software, right? Okay. So what they what they are putting within uh, so when they purchase catalogs or they put catalogs within the platform, um, it, it may come with specific tags. It might it might come with a young adult uh, tag, or um, that it might have language or things like that that might be tags that come along with it. So. Yes. So, yes. Many of the books, but but again, we're really we're we're limited by whatever is is brought forth into the system. And, that's, and keep in mind, tagging is a broad term. It is. Um, thank you. So there's a human being that has to make that interpretation on the front end. Whoever creates that record, that and I'm think not of the hard... something totally different from you. Yeah. So that's so, yeah. And it makes a difference so whether it's fiction or nonfiction. To me, the email notification seems the best bet because that way then you get an email that says your child checked this out you can decide i might say oh my mine can read that and you might say well mine can't so. I, I think i just want to point out uh lindsay makes a great point about the legal piece of it and, and i and i can assure you anything we do we'll, we'll make sure we go through that process because you know you're talking about censorship versus parental rights and parental notification. And I think we have to take both of those things into consideration moving forward. Uh, we are trying really hard to come up with a way that parents can be more involved and, and, and that they will be notified if their child is, is selecting a book that they may not want their child uh, to select. And I think that's important. We've heard loud and clear from our parents um, that they want to see that happen. However, Nothing precludes parents from right now saying to their child, if you check out a book from the media center, I want to see it when you get home. I mean, there's nothing that stops our parents from taking that responsibility right now and having that conversation about whether or not a certain uh, piece of literature aligns with their family values. And I just strongly encourage parents who are very concerned about this, don't wait for us. I mean, please be having those conversations right now because you can control this as a family yourself. However, I think it's important that we, we don't want to rush. We want to make sure we get it right. And I don't want to steal their thunder, but I know this is coming up later. But we do know <laughs> the legislature is dealing with this too. There might be something that comes out of that that we're going to have to react to. I don't want to get out in front of the legislature 
And I don't want us to be in a position to where we're overreacting. We are taking the concerns seriously, and we are trying to put something in place that would involve more parental um, approval of what their child is selecting. I will say, as we're having these conversations administratively, what we're finding as we research some of these books that have been identified, number one, they've been on our shelves for a very long time, for the most part. Number two, they're not getting checked out very often. Um, great point about you do not want to uh, stereotype kids. You have to be really careful about putting books in a certain section where everybody says, oh, that child's going to look in that section. So we have to be really careful about all of those things moving forward. And as Mike and Leanne and our team has these conversations, you know, more and more questions get asked, which is good. You know, people who work in our media centers are saying, oh, well, what about this? What about that? Things that oftentimes we don't think of, but they're working. Not there day that's day right. Day. They're working in the trenches every day working with the kids. One of the things we have found the last few years, our media centers truly are, in most places, become the hub of the school, but they're not your traditional libraries. What you see, what I see, when I look in the media centers today, kids are, it's almost like a coffee house. Kids are working on projects. They're, 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 they're working individually. They're doing research. They're not going in there reading books. Well, they just don't se. have as many books. Did There's you see not East? as many. That's right. When we were gonna, there at East. I was going to point that out. There's not as many books because most people are doing this right now. They're not checking out hard covered books. So again, I think we need to be responsive. I feel like we are being responsive, but we have to weigh all those things moving forward. Well, and I think it's interesting. I mean, not to, but, um, you know, when my kids, they can't Google, or I, they might be, but I tell them, please don't Google unless, you know, or ask Siri on your watch yeah. questions, because, you know, I ask me the question beforehand, and that's how I kind of feel like with books, too, and I've run into it myself. Actually, last night, the book I was reading in my first grade, I was like, huh, I think I'm going to read this later, but, um, but, I mean, it wasn't anything terrible, but, um, you know, I think as the, the age of the internet gets bigger and information's there and then we're just growing so we have more information and you know on the TV and on the radio more curse words can be said than when I was growing up so I just think it's just you know we're just gonna have to learn to be more filter appropriate as parents and I'm learning to do that um, and of course we're gonna do what we can to make it right and that's what you all are doing mm -hmm. um, but you know there I definitely think the accountability needs to be stressed. You make a good, another good point, and Kristen Duchel was here a couple of years ago talking about, you know, making sure our, our students are virtual savvy in the virtual world. They, they know the difference between research and stuff that's really not research. And, and, and Todd and David and the team and school safety will tell you, you know, what we deal with more than anything else in our school system is stuff related to this and, right here. And having them, and I think Kristen is the one actually who was telling me about it, is, you know, having, because I was kind of more like, well, let's just not give access. Let's just not get, and she's like, well, it's kind of better to teach the child how to be the best leader. An educated consumer. Right, right, right an right. educated consumer, and I Digi was like. Digital citizen. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt and got, yeah. got yeah. off on that. No, but, that, but that, that's good. That's why we're here. But that, mm -hmm. that, Previously, years ago, we had an acceptable use policy in our school district. Um, and then we transitioned that to a responsible use policy because mm -hmm. we, we really wanted to focus on the responsible use, how you should be using it, not just you know the, the limitations of what you should and shouldn't do. We wanted that, to teach them the responsible side of it. And that's why we changed the language to that, which is exactly what you're, what you're saying. It's really making mm -hmm. sure that we're teaching them the values behind the decisions that they're making also. Sounds good. Well, I'm going to continue on. We've talked about that one of the strengths of our district is the strong partnership with parents and community members. And so we want to leverage that. And so as we continue to work with our media personnel, we want to give them specific training on how to bring in the community, how to involve your parents and community members even more. And so some of the ideas we're looking at is really promoting that the media center is a place for family and that we have literacy nights at school. We want to build strong relationships with our parents and our media personnel, whether they're um, certified media specialists, pair pros, our instructional technology specialists, all the people who have access and work in our media centers, 
uh, to make sure that, that our parents and our community members have that direct connection with them when they have questions or concerns. They can go directly um, in that area. We want to look at things like making sure our community knows who our media specialists are, promoting them in our newsletters, our websites, um, instituting community book clubs, bringing in, really focusing on the joy of reading and doing that in more of a community focus. And even things like a parent coffee talk to look at new books that are coming out, upcoming events, and really help our parents feel like they're a part of this process. So one of the questions that came up with the district media uh, conferences is also what, um, what, challenges, uh, what challenges for explicit content be, can be expedited in any way. That was the, kind of the, one of the recurring conversations, really. You know, how can we move this up? We heard the issues that um, though we moved the book challenge process from 45 days to 30 days, that if, if there are you know, dozens of books that need to get challenged or reviewed, you won't even be able to complete them within a year. So we tried to figure out a way that we could really help with that process and still stick true to the form of the procedures and the policies that we have in place. So we had some conversations um, around what that would look like. And so we talked about having a district subcommittee so that if there were challenges at a school level for explicit content, then those would be referred to the district. And there's some benefits to this as a whole. Number one, the district would have subcommittees. And, and again, we literally just came up with the premise this past week. We have to flush out all the details. Um, but, but we have a pretty solid consensus of, of the benefits that this will bring. Um, so having uh, many subcommittees, that means that we will be able to do uh, many more book challenges simultaneously at the same time with smaller groups. Still have, having uh, a, being vetted throughout uh, a variety of people that are on the subcommittees. Um, parent representation as well. Um, but then they would then report back their recommendation to the larger district committee to then vote on vote and approve. It completes the, uh, the process of having uh, to ensure that the books are read entirely. Um, it meets uh, kind of a community standard by having a variety of people um, still reporting back as well. Um, the benefit to this as well is that a decision would be for the entire district and not just that school. And that was a concern that was brought up as well by parents is that if one school says that they want to keep the book, but another school says no, um, no it doesn't meet our standards, kind of the conflict that that creates within the school district. So, so say a, a challenge was brought forth at Otwell Middle School, um, then that would be reported to the district subcommittee. It would then get evaluated. And then um, the district committee would then vet that. Again, we're only talking about challenges for explicit content. Um, then that would be a decision for the entire school system for that uh, for that grade level, or, or depending on whether it's a grade level um, or a school level or not. We heard that from our principals too. They actually agree with that. It was pleasant. They they wanted it to be a system decision, so they didn't have to go through that. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So that was right. encouraging mm -hmm. to hear that they're So we feel that. that was that's you know a couple steps in the positive that will you know help kind of alleviate some of the concerns that were brought forth as well. Okay. And I know this is a new idea. Do you, are you looking at putting a time frame on it, or just it has to be within those 30 days? So still within the within thir the 30 days, because okay. in, in one of the concerns, and that was not uh, like a week. Or no, that was a concern. Well, depending on some legislative legislation right. that may come down, that, that mm -hmm. might change. Um, <laughs> but uh, the concern with that, and, and a parent brought the concern, and we shared that um, the folks that are on the committees that are doing the the book reviews. Um, their teachers, their administrators, their parents, they have full-time jobs. Um, they have, you know, a parent nights that they have to deal with as well. Um, if they're administrators, they deal with so many after-school events as well. So they really are going to be reading these books outside of their time, in addition to their family time that they have to have. So counting it down from 45 days to 30 days initially, there were some concerns about that time frame, but they felt that it could, could get done. So when we were looking at shortening up even more, then that's where the challenge would come in. And you could have many subcommittees. Right? Exactly, and that's yes. it. For, until we kind of get yes. the and cool. and that's the game plan. And we're we're really limited on the number of people that we can that we can solicit to serve on the committees. Um, but say we have ten subcommittees going on at one time, then that means that we could have ten challenges going on at one time. And I, I want to say that also, previous to this year alone, we probably had one to two book challenges in the district a year. There were very few book challenges, um, and I, I know we're in a very sensitive time right now where it's very, um, it's very much on everyone's um, topics of discussion. Um, and, and again, in a year or two, it might subside as well. Um, but at least, you know, we'll be able to be a little more responsive to the concerns that are brought forth also. Um, 
some of them are hard to read. Those that Jeff said weren't checked out much. I, I bought one or two just because I wanted to educate myself on the whole book. I'm struggling. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I hear you. I hear but you. some of these books now, they've brought so much attention to them. If you go to the bookstores like Barnes & Noble, they're front and center. Like they're mm -hmm. selling, oh, you yeah. can't get them on Amazon, you can't get them other places. So it's right. actually kind of... It's benefiting. It's sure. benefiting I, these books. You said hard to read. It wasn't because of the explicit content. Just that was just the oh, overall. Oh no! Content. I mean, right. because right. nobody checks them out because they're. Bo I mean, they're just yeah. really not hard the most to exciting. Read. They're hard to not. No, I haven't even gotten to any. I mean, I, some of them I <laughs> expected the to book. open and think, you know, and I haven't even gotten to that yet. So I think it's very. <clears throat> There yeah. was very little in the couple that I chose to read. Mm -hmm. We're reading the same it's one. It's, just, it's a hard start. It like, me it's a complicated book to read. <laughs> the, the old process really <laughs> defined that there was one book every 30 days or one book every 45, right? Correct. Yes. 45. This now will allow multiple books within that 30-day period. That's correct. correct. That's correct, right. Exactly. Correct. But, in, but like you mentioned, there's only been a few. If, if you look at the 10 or 15 that have come to us, that's out of 540,000 items. Correct. That's like mm -hmm. point. That's zero point zero zero two percent of our collection right. that's been brought up the concern. That's correct. So I think we need to give credit to our media specialists that they're doing a really good job, and we appreciate all the work they've done for years and years building a good collection. And there's just going to be some of these that have been out there, and also all the work's being done on the front end to just refresh and remember the policies and practices and ordering so that we don't get to this point. So they're doing a great job. This is just a few things that have snuck through the cracks, and they're learning how that happened and how to avoid that. Right. So that actually kind of leads in to the next topic right here, is that, um, so we looked at also, what are, what are some policies and procedures that we can update to be more pro proactive and consistent as well? Um, so one of the things that we're going to require, we're going to um, build it into our procedures as well, is that we're going to be requiring schools to complete an annual comprehensive review of their media center um, books. Um, and this means that they're going to be looking for outdated books and low circulation numbers. Um, many of the, the, the bullet there, many of the questionable books came uh, from older or initial connections, collections that were brought into the media centers a long time ago. Uh, a challenge with that um, also goes into the second bullet is that uh, Previously, when books were brought in, uh, the media specialists w might look f at the professional reviews um, to, to identify you know, the, the instructional merit that it might bring also. There might not be any type of conversation about some of the content or the mature content that might be in there. Um, so one of the things that we're also going to do is we've spoken with them this year and, and asked them to do this, but we're going to be putting this into the, uh, the procedure manual as well to make sure that they're doing it um, on a regular basis, is that requiring new purchases that they do to also vet it through alternative sources. Um, when, we, when we looked at the professional re reviews of some of the books that were, that were brought forth, um, nowhere in there did it say anything about some of the content that was in there. But when you looked at Common Sense Media, when you looked at Amazon reviews, that's when you get a true reflection, a more diverse reflection of the type of content um, that's found in there. So that's one of the things that we're going to have them do is also take a look at alternate review sources to make sure that they're getting a full picture and not just um, a professional review that might just be talking about the, um, the scholastic merit, though it might have um, uh, throughout the content too. And then also continuing um, with both our school and the district level, we want, as we've talked about, really increasing our parent involvement. We want to go back and look at those committees. Every school has a media committee. Our district has a media committee. But we want to redefine those roles and make sure that we have good representation of the different stakeholders, both within a school building and a school community and also with our district community. So we're looking at that. We're looking at increasing the number of people that are on those committees, making sure that we have have administrators, teachers, media specialists, parents, and in some cases students, um, especially at the high school level, who can help contribute their, um, their opinions and their experiences so that we are making good choices on this. Um, from a teaching and learning standpoint, we have a very um, extensive process that we go through when we're looking at instructional materials, um, and specifically the supplemental text that we use in classrooms. For our middle schools and high schools, when teachers are selecting novels to read with their classes, those have gone through a vetting process. And so Robin Elmore, who's our secondary ELA specialist, has designed a very extensive process that includes representation from all of the schools across the district um, in looking. So a teacher can say, I'd really like to read 
and name a, a novel in my seventh grade ELA class. And so a committee reads the book, we look at it, we look at the standards, we look at the literary value, we um, analyze it for a variety of things. So as some of these challenges are coming up, we do want to make sure that we're taking advantage of the work that we've already done on many of these novels and include that in the challenge process. We, some of the, the concerns that we've had involve books that are on our AP list. Um, you know, our, our advanced placement classes are college level classes, and some of the texts do have a more mature content. Our AP exams will include text um, that, that may have that. Those are courses that are self-selected. Students and, and parents um, understand that that is at a level that's higher than a high school level that, that could have those topics. But we also want to be certain that when we're looking at text, um, especially any that are be cha being challenged, that we are looking at it from a holistic view and an instructional view in addition to the, the content itself. Would any of the, or, or moving forward, if someone challenges an AP class book, mm -hmm. could it, like, could it, could a, could an AP, could a book be used in an AP class, but then, like, not be allowed in a Yes, Center, That's one of the things that we discussed with the district media committee was looking at situations like that. That in that situation, you have a, a specific need and a different, maybe a different population, a different instructional context um, where that book may be applicable, but maybe not appropriate for a general population. Okay. It's something we haven't yeah. decided yet for sure, but it is something that's under consideration. Okay. And, and Lindsay, an example of that would be um, the Toni Morrison book, The Bluest Eye. Right. That's a book that's commonly used um, on AP exams. It's commonly cited. Um, it is not one that's currently on our approved novel list for supplementary materials, but many teachers put that on a list of additional books that children might want to read in an AP course. We've taken that off for the time being because of the decision with those eight books. Um, but that is something that our AP teachers um, were concerned about because they don't want our students to be at a disadvantage when they take their AP exam in the spring. And there might be questions related to that. There's, there's numerous books that are cited on an AP exam. Um, students can't possibly read them all. But that's one that's commonly used. And we don't want our students to be at a disadvantage. You're saying right now, if it was challenged, it's just pulled kind of from everything. If, not if, if a, it's, not if it's challenged. I mean, not if it's challenged. It, it, it's, yeah. it would go through the process. Right. But what we would like to see is that we're taking in that consideration. If it's a supplementary material, if it's something we've already vetted and approved as a supplementary instructional resource, we want to be able to use that information. It's a very extensive review process that we use for those novels. And I think that information would be important to consider. So that's part of that process when a, the review process would be mm -hmm. when the, the committee is making a decision, um, is it making a decision for the media center, but also taking into account the instructional uh, uses in the classroom, such as an AP class. So it might be that it, it might be that it's removed for, from the media center, but it's allowed for a specific but, class, AP class or whatnot as well. So where we are, where are we now with the next steps? So the next steps, really, we're going to continue working with the district media committee on refining the changes that we proposed with you today. Um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. We'll be meeting later on in March, April, May to fine tune the process that we'd like to implement for next year. Also, um, again, currently watching the, the legislation to, to identify what type of changes would need to take place if uh, some of the bills are proposed. Um, also, we, we have to be really sensitive to the balance between you know the explicit content of book removal versus the censorship that's something that has become more and more in the forefront of the research that I've been doing as well um, so that's just something that as a district as a committee we have to be aware of also and, and Dr. Bearden had already alluded to that and we do expect to have that information pretty soon the the Georgia General Assembly should be finishing up their legislation within the next month so this is something that we can move forward with quickly and as Mike said we have meetings already scheduled with our district media committee over these next few months that we'll be able to move quickly um, once we see what those recommendations from the state are uh, and then finally we have over the summer we meet with our leaders our school leaders and our district leaders both in June and July for different purposes in July we have a leadership summit where we really work with our school leaders on um, 
more of the logistical and managerial tasks that are coming up for the school year. So we are planning to host a, a session at that leadership summit that really works with our school leaders, our principals and assistant principals on these changes in our media center, on those guidelines that our district committee will be establishing, those expectations and procedures, those revised procedures, to make sure that our school leaders, our principals and assistant principals are very aware of the changes we're putting in place and that they can help make sure those are being followed. So those would be things like your, me your school media committee. Who needs to be a part of that? How often they need to be? What are the processes that they'll follow if there are any book challenges? And for purchasing books as well. And then the different processes within the media center. If we're making changes to destiny, to the way we're uh, involving our parents in those checkouts, in the alerts that they may receive, we need to make sure that everybody is aware of that. So we'll have an, a, a very extensive meeting with our principals and assistant principals in July. Before we open it up to, to questions from the board, I just want to again remind, if Follett makes that change to destiny in the near future, we'll, we will implement that mm -hmm. uh, immediately so we do address that issue of parental involvement. So as soon as that is at our disposal, and hopefully it will be sooner rather than later, we're not waiting on that. We will implement that right away. So with that, questions, comments from the board? My comment is that, you know, wisdom comes from the past and from our learning. Um, <laughs> I keep through this process of change and, and update, I have flashbacks to the time we went from aluminum foil on our antennas to a cable box and more content and more grading of that content and more restriction of that content given to the parent. So it's kind of following the same thing. It's funny that books are now after multimedia content and, and like Jeff said, the the, the multimedia and the phone internet has really opened that up, you know, so it's not uncommon to have that, the TV in your room now because it's so cheap to have that device with all the controls and aspects and hopefully it's being taken care of much like these resources will. So it seems like we're following the same path. The wisdom is following true and we just have to stay the path and get it to a place to where it's acceptable in our society. That's a great, I mean, that this generation, I mean, I don't know what the percentage is, but rarely will you see them with a paper copy book in their hand, this generation. M myself, I prefer a book mm -hmm. than reading it online. But, you know, I don't know what the percentage is, but I know with my own kids, mostly what they read is it's, it's on print, not, I mean, not, not a book. It's technology. So other questions, comments? Um. I would just like to, I guess, comment. Well, first of all, my kids keep calling me, so everything's okay. But if you see me look at my, f I think they're wondering if they can have a snack or something. Because um, so, I tell them, don't. I was going to say they're excited to read their book. They I know. I, well, I tell them don't eat because I'm, I'm afraid of choking. So I'm like, don't eat what it's been all. They're like, can I have a snack? I'm like, yes, you're old enough. You can eat on your own. Um, oh, um, oh, what? I, so I just wanted to say, just this whole process. I appreciate. Um, you know, I, I think y'all have had a lot coming at you, um, and, um, you know, part of what I try to do is communicate, you know, so that I can insulate some of that that's going on so I can share, hey, this is really good progress that's going on, you know, this is taken seriously, these, you know, this is a really pressing issue. So um, I just appreciate you all doing this and, you know, taking the initiative. I think these ideas are really great. Um, you know, I have heard, you know, can't we just have a catalog system ourselves? And I, I mean, I, I don't know if that would even be, <laughs> you know, I mean, I don't know how much that would cost and stuff. And so it's, you know, all you all are taking time, you along with the media specialists, along with the committees have put a lot of time into this. Um, and I just know that it's, or want you to know that it's not lost on me and what I try to share with the community. And I appreciate what you're doing. Um, so that, that's basically it. I know it's an emotional topic, and I'm glad that we're able to, you know, get things moving along and, and come to the end. But the whole time, you all have been focused on it, so I appreciate that. Thank you. Just, I just say that what she said, I think you've got a good plan, and I know it is a hot topic, but you're doing the right thing. Taking, taking the time, talking to the people, and making sure that Look at it all aspects from the media, you know, everybody that's involved instead of just a knee 
knee jerk reaction. We got to do something. So hang in there. Thank you. So um, just so I think that we're all on the same page and we understand this, if all books that want to be challenged, doesn't matter if they're challenging the title, the length of the book, or the context of the book, or even if they come to a board reading and they start reading it and we stop them, that content, every single book has to go through the book challenge. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes. And we all understand that, right? And this board, that any book that comes up, it has to go through the book correct. challenge process. That's correct. What is the book challenge process look like and who owns that okay so the book challenge process it starts with with a, a parent or a concerned community member um, reaching out to the school administrator to the principal um, and the principal would talk with them about their concerns with the book if they want to initiate a book challenge process uh, they have a form that they would complete uh, part of the form it gets into the, the parents actually being specific about the reasons that they're challenging the book um, it goes into the specifics, you know, what, what page numbers, what are the concerns, what are the actual um, uh, items that you're concerned with. Uh, once they submit that, then currently, where we are currently right now, is that that would then go to the school district media, or I'm sorry, the school media committee. Um, they the principal have, would give that to the committee? Yes. So they're yep. responsible that they took the complaint, they'll give it to the committee at the school. That's right. So they, they would call the committee. They have to then find the number of books um, because everyone on the committee would be reading the book, so they have to find the number of books. Um, and that's one of the things that usually, if a book challenge goes takes place, all the books are, are gone. They're actually borrowing books from other schools or having to buy books. Um, so, so the concern about you know should books be removed from the shelves if a, if a explicit content challenge comes through, they're already removed from the shelves um, because we have to go above and beyond to try to find as many books as we can. Um, so that every person on the committee mm -hmm. has the ability to read the book. Um, uh, then when the decision is made, within 30 days, there's a 40, uh, another 15-day extension if needed. Um, if the, the uh, person is not happy with that decision, then they can appeal to the district media committee. The district media committee would go through the same process. That's a 30-day because everyone on the district media committee would then need to read the book as well, do evaluation of it. Um, and then if, the say, the committee is then uh, decides to keep the book, they can then appeal a third time, which would go through Leanne, and that would then come to the board. Um, so that's where the current process is as well. Uh, so um, it would go to the district board, or it would go this to, board? to the board of education. To you all. To you all. Committee, district committee, and then all the and then to the, the board of education. Right. And now, and that is our current board policy. Mm -hmm. And that is, for the record, that is board policy IFBD, which is media centers. Mm -hmm. So all of those steps are outlined in board policy. What we're proposing is that some of those explicit content skip the school level process, review process, and go directly to the district review process. OK. And when will you be ready to implement that part? So we're looking at, we're looking at implement, implementing that for next school year because we have to work through the guidelines. There are a lot of changes. We have to actually kind of solicit the number of people that would be able to serve on the subcommittees as well. So that, that would be something that we'd have to work through the details. And that's something that would be taking place throughout this school year as we're uh, in the last uh, few, few months. But to your point, Wes, the people that come to the meeting to read a book they're concerned about and then maybe come to another meeting 30 days later, that's a month. And during that time period, if they were concerned about it, they should start and launch the process at their school right away, which would be faster than coming to multiple board meetings and reading out loud. In 30 days, it potentially could be processed and handled if it needs to be. That's correct. So that's the most But that, not until next school year. No, it's right now. They can start it. They yeah, can start a book It's one book every right 30 now. days right now that's for thing, right now. Right. It's just that there's so... It would be so. next school year when the subcommittees would be in but place. We have for every school have their own so it could start at the local school level so they could immediately challenge it right now at the school so if there's level. a book at north high book at west book at east those you know those would be three books if they're at those different schools as well that would have to be a consolidated process of okay you tackle this you i think i think west brings but the chance of three parents reading this, this we've had these books in the system for years and years and years so the chance of a book that's been sitting around for years to suddenly pop up at all three at the same time? Well, I understand that, but I think, especially now, and I've, I've heard that before, um, but I think especially now, I think with the, you know, I think there could be more even now potential for the books to be expedited since there is focus on it, and they are in our, so instead of going to Barnes & Nobles, they can just, oh, maybe we have it in our school or something, you know? So I, I do, I, 
it, it, are there conversations being had about how to fill in that gap before the actual process is refined and done in I, in I know this sounds process. very simplistic in nature, but I would just encourage any parent who's concerned about a book to prohibit their child from reading it. Right. I mean, w there's nothing stopping a parent from doing that right now. I mean, yes, there's some things we'll go through as a district if, there, if, if an appeal is made, but if I, as a parent, if I'm concerned about what my child is reading, I'm not going to allow them to read it. Right. I, I think the issue is, with, and I totally agree with that, but I think the issue uh, is just the number of books um, that with the ex explicit, um, I, I mean, I'm, I just, I that's why this process is put in place so we can deal with that. We just can't wave a magic wand and do it. I mean, we, got, we have to put those things in place. We have to put those subcommittees together. So we're being responsive to that. Right. Uh, to me, the bigger issue than that is that number one bullet about parental involvement, which we're trying to address right now with right. Follett through, through Destiny. And as soon as that's in place, we, we will implement that. So right. but I guess back to my original question, the process that we need to tell somebody tomorrow to follow is to go see the school principal, right. even though in here it's going to later on it's going to expedite. Right. We don't know when this is going to be in place, right. but right now we're still going yeah. next school year. Right. We so would right have to now we're still following policy. the old process of book reviews. That's correct, and it would mm -hmm. still even next year it would still initiate at the school level, and then they would be sending it on to the district at, at that point. But again, we'll work through the details, and we'll we can we can revisit that with you once we have everything flushed out as well. And the, the, just to clarify, the school committee wouldn't be reviewing that. The, it would go through the school, so the principal would look at the review, and if it's for explicit content, then the principal would have the discretion to send it directly to a district committee. That's what we're proposing for next to expedite next the process. That's correct. To have that yes. When we come back next school year, that's correct. Yes. So between now and September, the book challenge process will be the 30 days. And one of the things that Leanne had wrote this down for me as a reminder as well, one of the things that we're also investigating is the possibility of pulling together summer teams to do a, a larger comprehensive <laughs> review um, uh, and possibly identify, you know, books that we can get on the front end, identifying the front end also. Uh, again, that is just in the beginning stages. It, 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 for the district media committee, it's, it's 20 people, and trying to pull everyone's calendars together for two hours is a, is a challenging part. But, um, but that's something that's going to be on our conversation as we move forward as well. Mm -hmm. Is there a way that we can help expedite some of the books, the common books that might be challenged um, over the summertime? Again, there's logistics, there's finances that come along with that as well. But, uh, but it's one step in the right direction. As well. And can you clarify under policy now, as I understand it, a media specialist, just as they're going through, you know, going through books and, you know, just in the normal process right. outside of this conversation, that if they see a book that's older or hasn't been checked out, or perhaps they even see something that they're like, you know, I'm not sure this goes with the community or something. As that media specialist is pulling those, the media specialist has the authority to remove whatever book he or right. she wants to remove without it being yes. correct it, and that's part of the notice. weeding process each that's year the, exactly mm -hmm. the weeding process so we can identify those books as well so okay. and that's just a normal process correct. Mm -hmm. that. yeah. and that's something that we also are immediately doing is working with our media specialists to make sure that those regulations we have in place that they are continuing to follow those mm -hmm. so that weeding process there is there are procedures they go through each year to to look at their circulation to look at where, what are books that are just sitting on your shelves that haven't been checked out? Like, let's go ahead and pull those out and bring in some new books that might be more relevant or meaningful to our students. Because even with some of the books that were read at the last board meeting, when we went through to take a look to see, you know, where are they throughout the schools, several of, the, several of them have been around for a decade with being checked out two to three times. So those are books identified that really should have been, you know, weeded out over time as well. Um, and we're just reinforcing that with the media centers as well, just to, you know, be more consistent along those lines. And what guidelines do they use to do that on? Because I know you have to, there's guidelines in place for them to order new books, right? They, they can't order books with these many guidelines, right? So I, I talked to Kristen Duschel about that. There, there are no specific guidelines other than looking at, you know, the literary merit that, co that comes along with it. Um, when they do the reviews, they'll look to see are, are, there, are there books that really stand out as, as questionable with content along those lines. Um, 
So from, from that standpoint, there are no specific guidelines as in you must purchase you know, X number of books. Um, uh, books um, cannot have you know, 10 uses of an obscene word, things like that. There's nothing like that in there from a guidelines perspective. Um, so when they're looking at you know, even the removal of books as a, as a whole, that's, that's a bigger conversation in why it's best done in a, in a community format, in a, in a procedural way, so that it's, it's, the decision is made by multiple people on a committee. Because when you're looking at the state code for content con or obscene material, you're talking about um, a, a community's values, um, mm -hmm. the specific language to the average person taken as a whole. Um, and, and those are the things where it's best looked at on a larger committee. Part of the guidelines is the community input. Correct. Mm -hmm. But the weeding process just based on circulation Correct. is not content, but looking at circulation Correct. and trying to weed out books that are older books, maybe not relevant, and aren't being checked out. Can they remove it on content, too? I'm sorry. I don't know the laws about uh, Technically, you can, but you, then mm -hmm. you're also getting into censorship, um, which is a tricky, sensitive topic, too. Okay. So the weeding is more the circulation. Right. Exactly. Right. And if, if, if at a given school, if they're a certified media specialist, they have more authority to do the ordering and the removals. Because they've been trained. Because they've trained. That's if they're right. not certified, then they have to go do all the ordering and the removals have to go through the decision of the uh, local committee, which has teachers, parents, administrators. Exactly. Right. So, okay. And some, in some cases, students as well. One last thing. So this is an administrative process set forth under the superintendent, right? And you referenced the board policy. Correct. Are we going to have to change the board policy in the near future to reflect this, or is this going to stay administrative process? It depends on whether it is the <laughs> policy or the regulations that come along with it, um, so the procedures. Um, Would we know more You're, after legislation? Yes. Yes. And so that's part of why I know it, it's frustrating because it seems like we're moving slow. But as Dr. Bearden said, we anticipate that we're going to have guidance from the state based on whether these Senate bills or House bills are passed. And so we want to take that into consideration and make sure whatever laws are passed and adopted that we're following those procedures, too. Yes. Yes. And or DOE, probably. Both. So we should look forward to another update. And yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. And, and currently, there's a very detailed policy that just got passed in December of 2020. And it does talk about that the formal complaint begins at the school level. So my recommendation would be if we're going to change where some complaints go directly to the district level that we would need to look at our board policy and make sure that that's clear in the policy itself okay thank you you're welcome thanks, thanks, thanks guys. all right next item is uh future agenda items does anybody have any recommendations for any kind of future agenda items all right the next thing is executive session for personnel for student disciplinary records and for student educational records. Do we have a motion to go into executive session? So moved. So moved by Mr. Cleveland, second by Ms. Morrissey. All in favor?